Well, have you made your New Year's resolution? And that's the title of my sermon. What is your New Year's resolution? Uh, you know, I was going to make a New Year's resolution never to be late again, and I overslept on January 2nd. <laughs> uh, uh, Carol and I also made a New Year's resolution to take down the Christmas tree and Christmas lights before Easter. Certain year. <laughs> <laughs> here's something i read it says if you make a new year's resolution to just eat healthy food this year or go on the health food diet you won't actually live longer but it'll seem longer <laughs> that's true it doesn't seem longer <laughs> uh one guy wrote about a resolution he made. He said, 2012, I will get my weight down below 180. 2013, he said, I made a resolution. I'll watch my calories until I get below 190. 2014, I will follow my new diet religiously until I get below 200. He's not keeping up, is it? 2015, I'll try to work, develop a realistic attitude about my weight. 2016, I work out five days a week. In 2017, I made a resolution I work out three days a week. And then he said in 2018, I'll try to drive past the gym at least once a week. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, every year uh, people resolve to do this or do that, to stop eating so much food, to lay off the carbs, to lose weight, to exercise more, to enjoy life. And uh, but, but before I get into the message, Carol, our zip drive that we used to put the scriptures up is it messed up, so we don't that's the reason it's not on the wall today. But anyway, but anyway, a lot of people want uh, one of the main things that people make a resolution they say, Well, I'm going to go on a diet this year, I'm going to lose weight, and I'm going to exercise more. And we think about those resolutions, but what about our, re re uh, our relationship to God? Shouldn't we also be thinking about some resolutions in regard to God in order to grow in faith? You know, in 1 Timothy 4, 8, when you talk about exercise and getting ready and getting shaped, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 4, 8, for bodily exercise profiteth little. But godliness is probably unto all things having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. First of all, I must realize that I am not able to do anything without God's help. Therefore, we must humbly ask God to help us and enable us to keep these resolutions as far as they are agreeable to his will and for the sake of Christ. And with God's help, I will keep my word. 2 Peter 3.8 says that we're to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forevermore. Amen. I want to grow in grace this year. To be more merciful this year. To be more compassionate. To be more understanding toward others. And I especially want to grow in the knowledge of the word of God. Therefore, I must add to my faith, virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness and brother kindness and charity. I'm, I was remind, I'm reminded of what James says about growing in the knowledge of our Lord. And if we want more wisdom, and I truly want to grow in the knowledge of the Lord. I want more wisdom in his word. And James 5, 1, 5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So if we want more knowledge and wisdom in the word of God, we need to ask God to help us. And we need to ask God to help us to be committed to growing in knowledge and in wisdom. Are you growing in grace? Are you growing in knowledge of, of the Lord? If not, why not? Have you made any plans to grow in the Lord? Someone said the plan will work if we work the plan. 
But what if you have no plan? No planning equals no growth in Christ. First of all, if you're going to grow in Christ, you've got to set up a plan. A plan to say, okay, today I'm going to read this word. I'm going to go into my closet in my special place. And I'm going to read the word. I'm going to pray. I'm going to talk to God. And I'm going to let God talk to me. Let me tell you. Resolve number one. Here's the first resolution. I will do whatever I can to bring glory to God. Now that should be a re resolution all of us can try to keep. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the what? The glory of God. Whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Paul wanted to live in God's glory and not his own glory. Paul had said many times that he, he, he came to show people Christ. He didn't come to show people himself. And just like Jesus said, I have come to do the work of him that sent me. Can you say, I will resolve to do whatever I do in word or deed, I'll do it to the glory of God. We need to keep this as a guiding principle by asking God to help us. In this action, we need to try to continue to glorify God. How can I honor God to this action? How can I honor God by keeping Him in word and deed and doing all to His glory? How can I do that? We need to keep this, like I said, to guide us. Now that's saying a lot, isn't it? That's saying that everything I do, I'll do the glory of God. That means we have to watch. That means we'll have to be aware of all our actions. That means we have to be aware of our words, of our anger, of our temper. That means we'll have to be aware of our attitudes every day if we do everything that we do to glorify God. Every day we have to watch. When we speak to those we love or those who don't love us, we have to glorify God. This will be a hard resolution to keep. That in everything, in word or deed or whatsoever you do to glorify God. But you can do it. Before the Christian, with God's help, we can resolve to do that and, and do everything to the glory of God. Number two. I resolve never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last error of my life. I'll never do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last error of my life. Wow, how powerful is this? These are some things we wouldn't even think of doing the last error of our lives. Nor should we do them at any time of our life. But if it's not pleasing at our last hour, then it isn't pleasing to God at any time in our lives. Here's the fact. The fact is we don't know about tomorrow. But we know who holds tomorrow. Amen. We don't know when it will be the last hour of our life. We have heard it said that we should live every day as it were our last day. Life is uncertain. And we know death is sure. Just uh, on Christmas Eve. Uh, Christmas Eve now. Uh, one of my... Guys, Lester Tibbs, I graduated with him in at high school in Johns Creek in 1972. And his wife was coming across the old town mountain road. And she had a slick spot or uh, something and she went out of control. Boom, she died just like that. We're not sure of life. We don't know when our life is uncertain. We know death is for sure. The Bible says it's born unto man wants to die. And after this the judgment, I am reminded of what James said again. In James 4, 14 and 15, he says, Whereas ye, you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor, he says, that appear for a little time, then it's vanish away. For this you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this, or do that. Life is short no matter how many years we live. 
I thought about that the other day when we was, had the funeral of Lonnie Johnson. He's 89 years old, turned 90 on January the 1st. And I thought, you know, life is short no matter how many years we live, even 90. It's short. And the older we get, the shorter it seems, don't it? Don't be deceived into thinking that you have lots of time. Don't be deceived to think that I got time to live for Christ. I got time to enjoy your loved ones or do whatever you know you should. Don't be deceived into thinking that you got all the time in the world so you're not going to get in any hurry to live for God. You're not going to get any hurry to make sure your loved ones know how much you love them. Then no matter, you know, but if we do everything and if we're, if we'll try to serve the Lord every day and, and remember life is short, then no matter when your life ends, you will have fulfilled God's plans for you. I have thought many times, thank you, Lord, for giving me another day so I can ask forgiveness for what happened today. Lord, I'm glad I didn't die today because I lost my temper Lord, I'm glad that I didn't die today because I didn't ask someone to forgive me. I'm glad I didn't die today because I forgot to kiss my wife goodbye. I'm glad I didn't die today because I forgot to change my underwear. Did your mom ever tell you that? Make sure you got clean underwear on in case you have a wreck. Well, that's a, that's a, you sure, I, I think that's the last thing I worry about if I had a wreck, wouldn't you? But mommy always used to say that. But that's, I'm just kidding about that. But seriously, don't leave this world but not living for God. Don't leave this world but not giving Him the glory. Don't be deceived and thinking you got a lot of time because you don't know how much time you really have. And then resolution number three, never do anything out of revenge. Never do anything out of revenge. Now, someone wrote, I don't get mad, I get even. And I've said that to people. Now, I know we are to say this just jokingly, but some people are serious. They want revenge. They want to get even. But there's a better way. Don't get even, get ahead. Be the better person. Let God handle the situation. Let God take revenge if he so chooses to. In Romans 12, 19, it says, Do to beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Now, I like gun smoke. I don't know about you, but I watch gun smoke a lot. And I, uh, But, you know, I don't know. All they do is talk about drinking whiskey and coffee. But anyway... I was watching an episode of Gunsmoke one night, and you might have seen this episode. This man and his wife were headed to Dodge, and a big desert windstorm came up, and they were in a horse and buggy. Well, the wind had stirred up the sand and debris so much that, that you couldn't hardly see anything. And so their buggy hit a big hole, and it turned over, and the horses got loose and took off, and they run away. And... And to make matters worse, his, the wife is pregnant. Finally, a man came along on another horse. And they thought, oh boy, now we have hope. You know, now we can be saved. He'll help us. But this man came along on another horse and he asked, he says, which way is it to Dodge City? The man said, can you help us? Can you help us? My wife is with child and our horses run off and we're miles from the next home and we need help. And the heartless man said, I don't have time to fool with you. What do I look like, a welcome wagon or something? I got business to take care of. So he just rode off and left them there. Please, they said, mister, don't leave us. But he rode off anyway. And him and his wife began to walk and the wife walked as much as she finally could because they had turned over the wagon, she got hurt a little, and her husband carried her for miles, and they finally reached another home place. As a result, the woman lost the baby. 
And their neighbor rode to Dodge and got Doc, and Matt Dillon came with him. And the man told Matt, I'd like to find that man that left us out there and let him have it. And Matt said, don't try to kill him or do anything foolish. And the man said, I'm not going to kill him. He said, but he'll get what's coming to him. He said, the Lord will take care of him. That's what he said. He met the man in Dodge and they had some words. And he told him because he didn't help him, his wife lost the baby. And uh, he said it pretty heated it hotly. So this heartless guy who wrote off says, what are you going to do? Are you going to kill me? Are you going? You want to draw? You want? He said, I don't even have a gun on me. He said, I'm not going to do nothing to you. He said, the Lord will take care of you. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, at the end of the show, the same thing happened to the man who left the cup in the storm. He got in the storm himself. The windstorm came up and he fell off his horse. He broke his leg and here comes some fellows by and they helped him on his horse and they splint, they put a splint on his leg, helped him on his horse and he was all confused. He didn't know which way to go and he was going under a tree and lightning hit the tree and a big limb fell on him and killed him. And the old man, I remember what he said, don't worry, the Lord will take care of you. And he did, you know, in essence. And that's what I'm saying. Revenge is mine. The Lord will repay. Listen, forgiveness requires both attitudes and action. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That's what Jesus said. If you find it hard to forgive somebody who has hurt you, try these things. If it's appropriate, tell this person you'd like to heal your relationship with them. Lend them a helping hand. Send them a card or heal her a card. Buy them a gift. Invite them out to eat. Smile, be kind to him and her. Shake their hand. And many times these right attitudes of a Christian lead to right feelings and forgiveness. I know this is a tough one, but this is what the Lord would have us to do if we're his children, to do what he expects us to do because we are children of God. He expects us to be opposite from the world. He expects us not to want revenge, but to change revenge into love. That's what God expects. And then resolve number four. We study the scriptures faithfully and constantly and frequently. First Timothy 2, 15 says, Study to show thyself to prove unto God a work when not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. I know this is one thing I need to do more of is to study and stay in the scriptures daily. I'm telling you this is a secret. Stand in, this is a secret and stand in close relationship to the Lord and that stand in his word. How can we allow the Lord to speak to us if we don't read and study his word? Take time to pray. Take time to study the word. Remember the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God in Psalms 113.11. There are three great strengths in remaining a Christian and a faithful child of God. Now listen to these three things. And some of you need to listen real good. Study and read the scriptures. Have daily prayer. And be faithful to the church. And I don't know what's happened to some of you, but you know, we, we have a handful on uh, the same group come on Sunday night and we have a handful on Wednesday night. And, and those are times, especially on Wednesday night, that we share the word. We need to be faithful. We need to study. We need to pray. If you're going to remain a Christian, these three great strengths will help you. Study the scriptures, daily prayer, and be faithful to the Lord and his church. Psalms 1, 1 through 3 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. 
and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. That's the man who stays in the word and meditates upon it day and night. You can learn how to follow God by meditating on his word. Now, what do I mean by meditating? Meditating means you read the scripture and you take time to try to understand the scripture and you think about what you've read. That's meditating. It means asking yourself how you should change so you're living in God's will. And I read the word and it hits me, it, it stabs me, it's like a knife. The Bible says a two-edged sword. And I say, how can I change my life to fit the word of God? Knowing and meditating on God's word are the first steps to applying it to your everyday life. If you want to follow God more closely, you must know what he says. And the more we know about God's word, the more help we will have to guide us in our decisions every day that we make every day. There, there is simple wisdom in these three, three verses. And the more we delight in God's word and in God's presence, the more fruitful we're going to be. In other words, we add fruits to our life. We add fruits of the spirit to our lives when we stay in God's word and in his presence. We had, we had, we add love and joy and peace and long suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. We add these things to our life when we stay in God's word and in his presence. And then lastly, resolve number five, never believe that God cannot answer a prayer. Never believe that God cannot answer a prayer. I want to doubt, I don't want, I never want to doubt God when I pray. There is never a prayer that cannot be answered. I believe in prayer. I believe that God will answer your prayer. And I believe that God will answer my prayer. I never doubt that. The fact is God does answer prayer. In fact, God answers every prayer. You know, a lot of times when we pray uh, for somebody sick or we pray for somebody who's going through trouble, you know, and we pray for that person and we pray that God will heal that person, believe that God can heal that person, believe that God will answer your prayer, believe it can happen. Don't doubt God. In fact, God answers every prayer. If you think about it, although we need to realize and understand why he doesn't answer every prayer with an immediate yes, God knows what's best for us. Therefore, he does not say yes every time. He answers in three ways. He says yes, no, later. Sometimes we pray. I pray for my brother for 30 years and he finally become a Christian. God knows, he knows what's best, but never doubt he can answer your prayers. Listen to these verses. John 9, 31, he says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. In 1 Peter 3, 12, he says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. In 1 John 5, 15, it says, If we know that he hear us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. And in Psalm 66, 19 and 20, it says, But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath turned, not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. And in Matthew 7, 7, 8, everybody knows this one. Ask, and it shall, it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be ever opened unto you. For everyone asketh, receiveth. For everyone knocketh, the door. For everyone asketh, receiveth. And him that seeketh, find. And to him that knocketh, the door is open. Enough said to let you know and have confidence in knowing God answers our prayers. And he wants us to pray. Now, a lot of people pray for people who are sick and they don't get well. And I know that bothers you because you pray. I've 
had people say, please, preacher, pray for my brother. He's, he's going to die if something ain't changed. And I pray for that man where I pray for that woman and, and sometimes they end up dying. And then sometimes they end up getting better. You know, it, it's God's will. I said, God, is it your will that this man or woman rise up out of that bed of affliction? God, I leave it up to you. It's God's will. It's not our will. God has a purpose for everything under heaven. God has a purpose for something tragic happens sometimes because it might bring somebody closer to the Lord. In conclusion, if we're going to do better in any way in the new year, then we must start it with every day. A new year is no different than starting a new day. We do it one day at a time. Make it a habit every day to resolve to do these things, to pray, to read the scripture, talk to God, to try to uh, not have revenge, to resolve to do these things I mentioned today. And I, I promise you, if you'll try to do these things every day, every single day of the year, you'll have a great year in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll see new things happen in your life. What are you going to do to grow in His grace? If you're not a Christian today, today would be a great year to start off new, brand new, to be a new creature in Christ. As we stand and sing, will you come? When the Savior comes.